Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Jed. I'm the missions coordinator, uh, and I get the privilege to be able to uh, just start our service with some announcements, and then we get to do a call to worship where we get to read scripture together as a body of believers. So uh, to start that off, we're, we're going to go to our announcements, and our first announcement is we have a baptism course that starts today. Uh, it's at four o'clock, and so it's here at the church. This is a great opportunity for you to dive into uh, your faith deeper with God, to see if you want to explore that option of, you know, telling everyone, I believe in Jesus, and I want to show that to the world. Our next announcement is our leadership community. This is uh, where we get to gather together, and we get to, see, Greg is going to share some vision with us about the future of our church. So come out to that. That's going to be great. So September 9th at four o'clock. And then we have our Truth for Living classes that start uh, next month also. That's September 16th. And this is, pray about getting involved, because these are, these are just options we get to do that connect us with Jesus. We get to learn more about what he's doing. And then lastly, we have our community day, which is September 2nd. That's going to be a lot of fun. So come out to that. There's a ways to sign up are online or out there. There's a, there's a table out there where you can sign up. And uh, it's going to be at 11.30 after the service, which is at 10. It's not free, so sign up, pay. Uh, the service is free at 10, but come afterwards. There's going to be games. There's going to be water slides, great food. And it's an opportunity for you to connect with our people. And then also, we call it a community day, not because we just want our church to be there, but we want you to invite your friends. So use that opportunity to invite people out. Bring, Invite your friends, invite your neighbors to come out and to just experience what our church is all about and enjoy a time together where we get to just corporately fellowship. So if you would stand with me, we're going to read this scripture together, uh, and then we're going to continue on in our worship today. So let's read together from Deuteronomy. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and you shall be, at, you shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. Let's pray. Father, we come today before you longing for your love, Jesus. We want to open our hearts to you in this place. We don't come here for ourselves. We come here to worship you because you are the great almighty one. So with all of our heart and all of our soul and all of our might is yours. So today is yours, Jesus. Amen.
from the rising, let's sing it out. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. We sing praise, sing praise, we sing praise. Hallelujah! Sing praise. He is worthy forever. Save. 
as you find me. So take me as you find me. All my fears are failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything. What a wonderful name. 
respond to the Lord's power this morning, to his wonder, to his beauty. I invite you to surrender your life in response to his power and his wonder and his beauty, to lift your heart to him today in your hands and surrender all, that he would be the king of your life. Take my intellect and use 
Be seated. Direct your attention towards the screen. We do have a uh, testimony video to show this morning.
to France. Um, being on a mission trip, like, it really just, like, strips you bare, I think. And, like, you have to rely on God. Um, I was thinking the same question. The answer is, why not? Wherever I go, wherever we go. So that was, a, that was an amazing experience being able to lead that trip, and that just gives us an idea of what happens when we give to missions. Um, you see life change. You see things that happen. You get to experience things. You get to go overseas. Uh, not just that, you get to support these workers, those kids you see uh, in those ministries. So I encourage you to give to missions. Um, while, just I'll ask the ushers to come forward, and as they come forward, I want to point out two people that are actually uh, living on missions, uh, and they're doing what God is calling them to do. So if Miranda Silva could stand up, and if Gabby could stand up as well. Um, these two young ladies uh, are answering the call that God has placed in their heart. Miranda's been in Spain for a year, and she's experienced so many different things. If, uh, yesterday, she was able to share a lot of her testimony, what's going on over there, and seeing God do work in the school that she's teaching at. And so it's really amazing to see that. And, not, and then we have Gabby, who feels that call, and she wants to learn more about that. She wants to go, over, uh, go overseas eventually and be sent out by us and our family. And so she's actually going to a school in Salem, Oregon, to learn how and, and, and what to do to reveal Jesus on mission. So these are two people that are coming from our church that we can support. And so when you give to missions, these are the faces you see. These are the people that you give to when you give to missions. So keep them in your mind, keep them in your thoughts and your prayers, and don't forget to give to missions because these are the faces you see. So let's pray. Father, I pray for Miranda and I pray for Gabby, Jesus. As both of them head out to reveal you, Jesus, in different ways, I pray that you would strengthen them. That Jesus, as Miranda goes to Spain, that you would give her strength, courage, and boldness to teach these kids, to, to interact with the parents, Jesus, that her life would be an example of you. And Gabby, for Gabby, Jesus, I pray that you would just strengthen her, give her peace of mind as he travels away from home to a, holy, to a totally different culture. That Jesus, that she would be able to just find peace in you, Father, as she goes. And Jesus, I pray that as we give today, that we would give because you've called us to. We would give uh, because our money is not ours, and everything is yours, Jesus. So Father, I pray that you would, uh, that you would just infiltrate our hearts today and break down the walls that we have built up. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Now, sure as you can go forward. Morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Um, so our first through fourth graders, uh, you can be dismissed for treasure seekers. You see Mr. Angelo there, red bow tie, shouldn't miss him. Um, so yeah, Mr. Angelo's there. If, parents, if you haven't signed your child in, please follow them out. There's a way to sign them in, uh, and then you can pick them up uh, at the cafe uh, after, after the service. God bless you guys as you go. All right, if you would, please, I know that you've just recently sat down, but I'm going to ask that you would stand for uh, the reading of God's Word. This is out of Isaiah 43. 
uh, verses 1 to 7. The words will not be up on the screen. Uh, I want you to just listen. Just soak in the, the word of God as spoken by the prophet Isaiah. But now God's message, the God who made you in the first place, Jacob, the one who got you started, Israel, don't be afraid, I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you're mine. When you're in over your head, I'll be there with you. When you're in rough waters, you will not go down. When you're between a rock and a hard place, it won't be a dead end because I am God, your personal God, the holy of Israel, your savior. I paid a huge price for you. All of Egypt with rich Cush and Seba thrown in. That's how much you mean to me. That's how much I love you. I'd sell off the whole world to get you back. Trade the creation just for you. So don't be afraid. I'm with you. I'll round up all your scattered children, pull them in from the east and the west. I'll send orders north and south, send them back. Return my sons from distant lands, my daughters from faraway places. I want them back, every last one who bears my name, every man, woman, and child whom I created for my glory. Yes, personally formed and made each one. Father, I pray that this morning, I pray that this morning we would grow in our awareness, our hope, our delight in the fact that we were made for your glory. That you have put us together in such a way that we can show how beautiful and how wonderful and how amazing you are. So God, open our eyes to that great adventure that you've designed us for. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, you can have a seat. So Paul Tripp tells us that we are all junkies, all junkies for glory. We are glory junkies. We are hardwired for glory. We, we simply can't get enough of it. We, we long for it. We want to be close to the mesmerizing. We want to get near the beautiful. And maybe you've seen a documentary about, about these penguins and, and, and them and diving into, uh, into the freezing cold water but what you never see is you never see those penguins getting out of the water and being like, dude, did you see that? Did you see that backflip? That was awesome. You, you never see judges, you know, penguin judges on the side like 9.4, right? You, you never see that because penguins aren't hardwired for glory. Like it, it's human beings that, that want to get close to glory. We want to bask in it. We want to delight in it. We want to enjoy glory. Penguins, they're just sliding on ice. But for us, we, we, we long to be near glory. We just want to get close to it. We're the ones that wait in traffic to get close to a Super Bowl parade. We didn't play in the game, but we just want to be near the glory. We want to get we want to get close to it. I mean, we watch highlights, right? So you you watch Sports Center and you 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 watch highlights. You don't watch like, oh, they walked another batter. And here's another. They walked another batter. Right? You don't you don't see that. You don't see the the single base hit, the the average play. You watch it for for the highlights. For, for the dunks, for the goals, for you know, for for the block shots. You you don't watch it for the, the normal things. We watch it to, to get close to the, to the glory. We get excited to see a celebrity, right? I don't know if you've ever been in a place where you're like, hey, there's a, there's a celebrity. I remember this, this woman in like her 50s was so excited to see Will Smith. She like dove across the van, like there's the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, right? Like we, get, we just wanna be close to, to, the, to the glory. 
We're drawn to the, to the cascading mountains or, or, or the power of the ocean. You know, every year, six million people travel to Paris to visit the Mona Lisa. Six million. Like, you can see great pictures of it online. But they travel there because they want to get close to, to, the, to the beauty, to the glory. I, same thing with food. I mean, you have a piece of Aunt Pat's carrot cake. You're like, you have got to try this because we want to experience the, the greatness, the, the beauty, the glory. Grandparents showing pictures of their grandbabies. Like, do you see how they look like me? No, they don't. Right? But, but they want to just show the pictures. They're just delighting in the glory. This is, this is us, people. Like, welcome to... Welcome to humanity. We are hardwired for glory. We crave it. We can't get enough of it. And we just want to be close to it. Paul Tripp says this, there is woven inside of each of us a desire for something more, a craving to be part of something bigger, greater, more profound than our relatively meaningless day-by-day -day existence. And we've been studying the book of Judges. That's where we've been over the, over the last few weeks. And we've been studying this book. And the way we've been studying uh, the book of Judges, and today we're going to be looking at uh, part two of Gideon's story in, in Judges 6. So if you have your Bible, you can turn there. But, but the way that we've been studying it is by picking out these key themes of the book of Judges. The first theme is that God wants to be king over every area of life. He's longing for wholehearted obedience. And then another theme is that there's both this unconditional and conditional aspect of God's promises. And then third is we need a true savior that all other human saviors point to. This is the, this is the blessing of godly leadership and that there's always a cost to compromise leadership. And, and so we've been see, seeing over and over again just the failure uh, of these various judges through the book. And, and so in today's installment of crazy leadership, uh, we're going to get a little break from the crazy because in this story, God just simply takes over. And the reason God takes over is because God wants to be king over every area of life. God, God wants to show that the best way to live is when we recognize that, that he's in charge. And so embedded in this story about Gideon is this theme of God wanting to be king, wanting to be champion, wanting to receive praise that is due him. And I think it's stories like this that have the capacity to save us from living lives of small glories, from living lives that are, that are really meaningless, that within a few years after our death, a few years into the, to the next generation where our life may, would have very little weight at all. But God wants to save us from, from lives that are small, focused lives. Where, as Paul Tripp would say, we would be self-focused little kings ruling a kingdom with a population of one. You can say, yeah, the, and the whole world is the stage, and there is this ongoing drama that's being played out. But that ongoing drama that's being played out around the world is not about our celebrities. It's not about our politicians, right? It's, and it's certainly not about us. The ongoing story around us is all and forever will be about God. That's what's happening. So this morning, I want to tell you a story, a story about a judge named Gideon, and he's, he's dealing with this people called the Midianites. But as I tell you the story, I want you to know that my goal is simply to invite you. I, I want to invite you to, to see the one who's in charge. I want you to look through the, the, the ancient story and see through their, their customs, their patterns, and what I want you to see is that there is a king who's in charge who is most glorious. And that king is worthy of our affection. That king is worthy of our adoration. That king is worthy of worship. That king is worthy of glory. So we need to be rescued from making life about us, about small glories, 
instead of him. So that's our story, all right? So we're going to look at uh, Judges. It starts at the end of chapter 6, and then it moves in through uh, chapter 7. I'm not going to read it to you. I'm really just going to tell you the story, and I'm going to put the, the text up on the screen uh, so you can follow along uh, by reading it up there, but I'm just going to tell you the story. So last week we met Gideon. If you remember Gideon, he was hiding in a wine press because of a certain people group. That's the, the Midianites and the Amalekites and the people of the east that were coming in and, and basically pillaging uh, Israel. And so Gideon was, was hiding. And so here in verse 33, after the story of last week, uh, while Gideon was, was dealing with this one localized idol uh, in the city of, of Oprah, what we find out is that the, the Amalekites, the, the uh, Midianites, they were on the move. They were busy. They weren't idle during um, Gideon's little battle. So while he was toppling the idol of Baal and hiding in a wine press, they were, they were on the move, and they were moving uh, into the Valley of Jezreel which is a very significant military location in the, northern part, uh, in the northern part of Israel. Actually, when Napoleon visited this part of Israel, he's like, all the armies of the world could gather here. Uh, and so this is a, a key location um, for uh, really taking over all of Israel. You can, in that valley, you can move into the mountains of the north or into the hill country of the south. So it is a key strategic military, military area. You can see, uh, if you're familiar with it, you can see that's Mount Carmel up there uh, with the story of Elijah. You see the Sea of Galilee. So this valley here of Jezreel is right in the middle with giving strategic points of access. So, of course, the Midianites um, would strategically move uh, into that area. So uh, perhaps his act of defiance uh, in chapter 6 was, was part of it, but most likely it was just the ongoing story of the Midianites wanting to take over. So what Gideon does is he now has a little bit of credibility because what he did at the beginning of chapter 6, he starts calling the people together uh, to, to, to raise an army uh, against uh, this, group of, uh, this group of invaders. Right? But what I don't want you to miss here uh, is, is uh, not simply that Gideon's raising the army, but remember, this story is not about Gideon, it's about God. So what happens is the spirit of the Lord that clothed Gideon. So before Gideon can raise an army, what's got to happen is the spirit of God has to empower him. The spirit of God has to clothe him. If the spirit of God doesn't, Gideon's got nothing. All right, so the Spirit of God uh, comes on Gideon, and Gideon is then able to call for the army to come. And the Holy Spirit is preparing him for his leadership role. So now Gideon gathers this army, right? He brings this army, uh, he brings this army together. He's, he's rallied the troops, uh, but then there's this break in the action, like you think it's ready to get the battle going if now the Midianites are all there in the Valley of Jezreel and now Gideon gathers his army together, but then there's this little bit of a pause in the story. And what happens now, right, in this pause in the story is Gideon uh, has some questions for God. Gideon is a reluctant leader and he wants to be sure that this is, that God, uh, he wants to be sure of God and he wants to be sure of his calling. So he asks God a question. He says, God, I, if you would, I'd like there to be uh, dew on the fleece, right? I want dew on the fleece, but, but then I want the threshing floor, and this is probably the wine press that he was hiding in before. I'd like this threshing floor. I'd like the rest of it dry. So if, if this is really you, God, if this, is, if this is what you're up to, this is what I'd like to, I'd like to see. Now, that then is exactly what God does. You see in verse 38, it was, it was so. Now, I'm not really sure why Gideon asked for this particular sign. I mean, I think I probably would have gone a little bit bigger than, you know, a, a wet fleece and dry ground. Uh, but anyway, that's what Gideon, that's what Gideon asked for. Um, and God responds, uh, and, and what the narrator says is not very spectacular, right? What, what the storyteller says here in verse 38 is that, and it was so. 
No, like, miraculous thing, no uh, powerful angel of the Lord like we saw in the earlier in the chapter. Nothing like that. Just this is what Gideon asked for, and that's what happens. Uh, but I think what happens then in this request is that it prepares a way for request number two. So Gideon's not, Gideon's not satisfied, uh, so he asks again, uh, he asks for another, another sign. So he says, God, don't, don't be angry. I got, I got one more request that I'd like to ask of you. Um, so with the first sign accomplished, uh, Gideon now asks for something that is truly miraculous, something that would only happen uh, if the supernatural were involved. And so he asks for a reversal of that process. So I would like this to be completely dry, everything else uh, everything else to be wet. So this is a contrast of, of the former request. And so now what you see is this one's a little bit more spectacular. Look how the narrator says it in verse 40. And God did so that night. God worked. Something miraculous, something miraculous happened. God showed up. God responds to Gideon's tests of him. Now, I'm curious about that. Like, why? why? Why does God show up and respond to Gideon? Why does he answer what seems to be like Gideon has already seen God work miraculously earlier in the chapter? He saw like this consumption of a meal that God just did miraculously. So, so why, is God willing, why is God willing to respond? I mean, I've tested God before, and I really haven't gotten you know, good results but why is God so responsive to, to, to Gideon's request? I, I can remember as a kid, I, I had heard the teaching about faith as a mustard seed, right? Maybe you've heard that one. And what can faith as a mustard seed do? It can move mountains, right? So I thought, hey, I live in Pittsgrove Township. It is pretty flat. I think it'd be pretty cool to have a mountain. So I remember I went out, I went outside and I said, God, if you're real, um, I believe you can do it. I would really like a mountain in our backyard. I'm not kidding. I really did this. <laughs> and, uh, and this is a picture of Pittsgrove Township. <laughs> no, now, see, I wasn't ridiculous. This is Mount Everest. So I was not thinking Mount Everest. I was thinking something more realistic like Mount Kilimanjaro, just something with, you know, some, some snow caps to it. And so I asked God, um, but... But it didn't happen. I mean, I, I didn't, I, I never got it. What's, so why does Gideon ask and receive? Why do I ask and, and not receive? Well, I think there's a big difference between Gideon's request and my request. I don't think it's in the capacity of God to move a mountain or not move a mountain or, or put uh, uh, dew on a fleece or, or round it on the ground. I don't think that's the, I don't think that's the point. I think it's that, Gideon is not playing at some, some request that is really about himself. That, that really my request was just about Greg's joy, Greg's pleasure. What Gideon is doing is saying, what, what is the character of this God? Like, God, do you, do you have the capacity to do this? And you might think, what, Gideon can't say that to God. Does God have the, the capacity to deliver from this enormous army? That's, that Gideon, can't, Gideon can't ask that. In chapter 6, Gideon had checked on the reality of God, but I think what Gideon's doing now is testing the capacity of God or the character of God. My tests of God were somehow tied to simply getting what I wanted or getting what I desired. Gideon's test of God is tied to, God, are, are you the kind of God that is able to do this? Remember, Gideon's living in a polytheistic culture where you have gods of all sorts of different things. So you had gods of, uh, gods of fertility and, and gods of harvest, and so you had gods of, of, of all sorts of different things. But what Gideon was doing was he was specifically asking something of God. Listen to what Tim Keller says about this. Gideon was very specifically asking God to show him that he was not one of those forces of nature like the other gods, but that he was sovereign over the forces of nature. 
Gideon then was not looking for simple signs to help him make a decision. He was really seeking to understand the nature of God. He was very specifically addressing the places where his faith was weak and uninformed. We often ask God for, for, for trivial things or for trite things or things that really serve our purposes instead of seeking God for what is God like? What is his capacity? What is his, what is his character? Gideon was facing an enemy that far outnumbered them. Like, like locusts, like, like, uh, like the sand of the sea. Like th this was an impossible odd. So to win against impossible odds, he needed a God of the impossible. And what we have to remember is where Gideon is in history. Where Gideon is in history is that that generation had forgotten God. They didn't know the works that God had done. They didn't know the character of this God. So Gideon is getting to know God. We live today with the written word of God. We have the capacity to study the nature and character of God over and over again in this book. Gideon didn't have that privilege. Gideon didn't have that for him, a personal study to get to know the character of God. The generation before had forgotten God. Gideon is getting to know what is this God really like? And God in his grace responded, not once, he responded twice to Gideon because he wants Gideon to know this is who I am. I just got to pause here and say, as we confront challenges in our life, this is why we need to be people of this book. This is why we need to know the nature of char and character of God as revealed here. So as we face enemies, we have the confidence of saying, oh, God can overcome that. I know the nature and character of this God. That's what Gideon is asking. God, what, what are you like? Are you... Are, are you the kind of God that, that can do this? So that's what Gideon needed, and that's what Gideon received. And I do believe that as we ask God, as we seek God, God will reveal himself. Look at Hebrews uh, 11. Uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 1. In the past, including the time of Gideon, God spoke to our forefathers through prophets at many times and in various ways. But in the last days, he's spoken to us through his son, Jesus. Now, as we confront the challenges, the enemies in front of us, we don't confront it like Gideon did. We confront it through the lens of there is a savior who has rescued us, who has reconciled us back to God. We are not alone. And we get to know that through God revealing himself here. All right, so God wants to be king over every area of life. God is wanting to reveal himself to us to make himself, to make himself known. Let's keep going in our story. So then what happens is Gideon and all the people who are with him, they rose up early and encamped beside the spring of Herod, Right, so, 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 so they, now they're, they're, they're going to be on the move. In response to these signs, uh, Gideon now moves his army into position to challenge the enemy. Right, so, so he's, going, he's now setting himself up for, for the battle. But before we get a description of the battle, before we get a description of, of this clash of these two groups, there's a bit of a digression, a step back. Because what God is going to do uh, is that what God wants to do is to ensure the fact that as he leads Gideon to victory, it results in true freedom. That as he leads Gideon to victory, uh, that, that uh, the, the, the glory isn't going to go to Gideon's army, which appears to be about 32,000. Uh, it doesn't go to Gideon's army, but, but true freedom is when, uh, not when God props up our little kingdoms or when God gives us the things that, that we think that we need. True victory, true freedom is when we enjoy the glory of the one who's far greater than us. And so God's gonna ensure that that is exactly what happens. So what God does 
is he said, Gideon, um, you have 32,000 uh, against a uh, seemingly infinite number. Uh, that's too many. So at the very moment that we think uh, Gideon is going to need every man available to him, uh, God says, you have too many men for me to deliver Midian into your hands. You got, you got too many people on your side. This is not advice that is included in any military manual um, that you, going against great odds, you reduce the size of your, your army. Uh, so what he does is God says, uh, there's 22,000 uh, 22, that need to go. So God says, I'm going to test them, and any one of this group that I say needs to go, they need to go. Because God is setting up, God is setting up his army. Right, so uh, let me get the right passage for you. I think my verses are a little out of order. So what he does is he says, if you're afraid, leave. If you're fearful, uh, you, can, you can go. And so 22 of his 32 leave. So he has 10,000 that are remaining. And then God says to Gideon, uh, still too many. We got to cut this down a little bit more. And so what God does then uh, is he goes further uh, and he says, uh, he takes them down uh, to the water uh, and, and he sets up this seemingly odd, uh, odd test, right? He sets up this, this odd kind of experiment um, for Gideon. Uh, and so he does it this way. Um, sorry, let me get the, the right passage here in front of me. Yep, there's still too many. Let me take them down to the water. So if the first group gets rid of, uh, he gets rid of them because they're afraid, this next group depends on how they drink the water. So he brought the people down to the water and said, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you'll set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down and drink, and the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink. So God creates this test that whittles the 10,000 down to 300. Now, there has been seemingly endless uh, speculation as to why uh, this number of 300. Uh, why is it that God gets it, or how is it that this tests work? And so I've heard different, different things. So you could say, well, the way I heard this as a child was that, you know, some would get down on their face and they put their face in the water. And when they did that, they weren't paying attention like good military people would as they would drink with their hand. Then they're alert. Then I heard somebody else, Josephus actually, writing in the first century, interpreted it just the opposite. He said, well, those people who scooped with their hand, they were actually more afraid so they're watching out to see if there's an enemy nearby. And those that were just putting their face in the water and drinking, they really were the ones that trusted God. The bottom line is the text doesn't tell us how this works. The bottom line is the, the scripture doesn't say, well, this is what God was up to. This is why God picked. What the text tells us is that God was gonna set up an army for Gideon that God was the one who was whittling this army of 32,000 down to 300. God was going to do it. And so if God is going to take the army down, God uses this measurement, and we don't really know why or how uh, God used it, um, or which, you know, which, why the 300 are the ones that, that scooped it up. But the point is that this is not Gideon's 300. The point is, this is God's 300. I saw this um, uh, as I was uh, kind of uh, looking for images related to the teaching. And I thought, how interesting that this really misses the whole point of the story. That it's not about Gideon's 300. It's not about this 300 mighty men of valor that win this victory. It's about God whittled an army down to 300 people so that God could ensure that he was the one that would be praised, not anyone else. I want you to think about that for a minute because that might make sense of a lot of your experiences in life where you get into situations where you're feeling pressed, where you're feeling squeezed, 
where you felt like you had 32,000 resources and you're seeing them dwindle and dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. And did you know that what God will do in your life is that God will actually reduce things down so that he gets praised? Did you know that God would, that God would be working that way in your circumstances? That God would lead you in such a way that you come to the point where I, I can't do anything else. I'm, I'm out of resources here. God, you've got to show up. And then God shows up and guess what? God's the one who gets the glory. God's the one who gets praised. That repeatedly in our lives and in our circumstances, God will squeeze us. God will, God will whittle us down. And what I want you to know is that is not an act of, of God being angry, God being disappointed, that God being against Gideon. This is actually a tremendous act of God's mercy to Gideon. So that Gideon would not come to the end of this battle and say, look what me and my 300 did. But Gideon would come to the end of this battle and say, look what God did. Look at the character and nature of God. Think of 1 Corinthians chapter 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this great treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but we're not crushed. We're perplexed, but not driven to despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, not destroyed, always carrying in this body of death, uh, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. God leads you into places of weakness so as to demonstrate how great, how sufficient, and how glorious he is. Remember what I said at the beginning, what God is doing is showing us that life is not a story primarily about us but life is a story primarily about him. And so God is leading Gideon to learn that firsthand. So let's move on in our story. In verse five, I'm gonna read you this section. So he brought the people down to the water. Uh, nope, I'm not gonna read you that section. I already did. So God selected his army and then that same night, that same night, what he did, oh boy, here we go, come on. That's right. So that same night, what he did was he told Gideon to go down and check in on the camp. So now the action is going to pick up again. And so Gideon goes down to uh, the camp of the Midianites, right? And so he's there in the Midianites and the Amalekites. So he goes down to check on this camp. Right, this, this camp of, uh, that, that God has given uh, into his hand. And so he's gonna check it out before the, battle, before the battle starts. And then we have this reminder of Gideon's experience as he goes towards this enemy's camp. The narrator tells us uh, that they were so many, it was like locusts in abundance. Their camels were without number, like the, like the, um, like the sand, right? So it's this massive army. And so as the closer he gets to the enemy at the moment of encounter, the, the bigger the enemy seems. Uh, but Gideon and his servant, they make their way to the enemy camp. And this is, this is what happens as he gets to the camp. He comes and, and he listens in and hears one soldier telling another soldier, right? An enemy soldier uh, telling another enemy soldier about a dream he had. And the dream was that there was this loaf of bread that tumbled into camp and it toppled the tent. And the other soldier, I mean, just think of what must have been going on in this other soldier's heart. The other soldier hears that and is like, oh, I know what that is. That's, that's Gideon and the army of Israel, like a little loaf of bread, and they're gonna come in and they're gonna topple us because God has given us into Gideon's hand, right? So this, this giant army, we get a little bit of insight into what's already stirring in them is a fear, not of Gideon, but a fear of God. 
that God's done something. And so, so th this group of people, they're starting to get afraid. And so Gideon hears that, and obviously Gideon's pretty pumped, right? Like they're afraid of us. They're, they're, they're afraid of us. We're down to 300. They have probably over 100,000 in their army. We're down to 300, and they're the ones, they're the ones that are nervous. So as soon as Gideon heard this, what does he do? He doesn't say, look at me, they're afraid of me. What does Gideon do? He worships. Because this isn't a story about Gideon. This is a story about God. So Gideon worships. He delights in God. And then he heads back up to his, uh, heads back up to his camp, grabs his 300 men, and then they're going to return for a very unique battle plan. Right? So what does Gideon do? He divides the 300 men into three companies and puts trumpets into the hands of all of them and empty jars with torches inside the jars. And then what's going to happen is he's going to give instructions at a certain signal, and there's going to be the, the blast of a trumpet. There's going to be a shout that goes out. There's going to be the breaking of the torches so that the light shines out. And so it looks like to this group of, uh, of over 100,000 soldiers that they're surrounded by this enemy. So Gideon's battle plan goes perfect. It works perfectly. So they found their positions around the camp, right? Uh, they, they, and as they let loose this cry, as they break these things, as the lights go off, there's this confusion that this, this army experiences. So they suddenly see these lights happening, right? And thankfully, we got a snapshot of what was going on. So they saw these lights come up, and then they're terrified. They don't know what's going on. They assume now that, that they are surrounded by this great war host, Right? So here's the crazy part of the story. Notice the soldiers. What is not in their hands right now? There's no sword. The Israelites scatter over 100,000 of the enemy. They don't even lift their sword. But what does it tell us in the text? It said that God lifted their swords. That God did it. Let's see if I can find that for you. Uh, no, it's back. It's in there. You saw it, Steve? It's at the back of this one. Back of the last one. Three companies. A sword for the Lord and for Gideon. No, that's, a, that's what they yelled. Uh, but in the text, I'm sorry, I don't have it. And I don't, don't want to keep skipping around there. But in the text, it actually says, what's that, Dave? Two, two, oh, verse 22. Yes. And the Lord set every man's sword against his comrade and against all the army. The Lord did that. So he created this confusion. They actually fought the battle against themselves on behalf of Israel. So God did it. God orchestrated it. Yes, it's a, it's a brilliant plan. It seems to uh, kind of equalize the, the, the size disparity between the army. It, it, it negates the differences in strength, but it takes advantage of the place of their fear, right? It does that. But the bottom line is it wasn't about the plan. It was not Gideon's strategy. It was the fact that God decided to win a battle, and he won a battle for Israel. God directed the swords of the great war host to turn towards each other. So let me finish this teaching. That's the story. Let me just give you two simple, very simple observations. We can see that what Gideon needed from God in the very beginning, what Gideon needed to hear from God was, uh, was regarding this fleece that would reveal that this was a God that had the capacity to be over circumstances. This was, a, this was a, a God with a certain kind of character that could direct weather patterns, that could order swords uh, of an enemy. So we start with, we start with faith in the character of God. So, 
if we want to live in the safety and the adventure where God is the most glorious one. In the glory of the king, if you want to live there, then you have to know what the king is like. You've got to get to know the character of this God. That's where Gideon started. So the rest of the story flows out of the point that Gideon knows what this God is like. So that's us. We've got to get to know what is our father like? What is his character? What are his ways? What is his nature? So that we can confront and we can live in the freedom where we're not making the story about us and the story about our resources. We're making the story about God. The second thing that we learn here is that if we want to live in the safety and the adventure and in the glory of the king, then you have to know that the moments, that your moments are not about you, that your moments, that your moments are about him. So for Gideon, as he walked through this narrative, it's not about his glory. It's not about him getting everything that he wants so that he feels comfortable, so that he can be uh, praised. It is all about God organizing things so that God can be praised. I got to tell you, these two truths were so meaningful for me this week. This week just seemed like there was one thing after another after another that just kept squeezing in just kept taking my, my resources of, of time, of energy, and I just was getting very, like, pressed in. And so as I'm studying this passage, I'm kind of feeling like Gideon, where I start with 32,000, and it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And the enemy is not going away. Actually, as I seem to get closer, the enemy is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And so these were the truths that I had to hang on to. And as I started to... As I started to press into, all right, God, what are you like? What is your character? What are your ways? Are you over this? Are you bigger than this? Are you in control of this? Then I started to have some some more confidence. And then when I realized the truth of, you know what, Greg, what you're hoping for is that you become the most glorious one, that you figure this out, that you solve these problems. You want yourself to look good. You want yourself to look big. And as I started to realize that and then move in like repentance, like, God, I'm sorry that I'm making my world about me, then I was able to walk in more freedom. Then it wasn't about the pressure of I've got to figure this out. It was the freedom of, wait a minute, God's going to show up and God's going to be glorified, not me. This is God's story, not Greg's story. So this morning... My desire for us in looking at this story and some spending some time with it is that there would be this movement of the Holy Spirit in us that would say, man, wouldn't it be beautiful? Wouldn't it be beautiful if my life was not about me? What if, what if my life was about making God glorious? What if I didn't feel the pressure that that I had to perform, that I had to get it right, that I had to win the victory? What if I could say, you know what? I have this treasure in a jar of clay, something fragile, so that the glory of God can be revealed, not the glory of me. So I think a good step in that direction is that we would say to God, we would say, God, I, I, I surrender. Like, I... I I give up. I I don't want life to be about me any longer. I don't want my world, I don't want to have to negotiate my circumstances so that I look good, so that I look glorious. That's not what my life is about. God, I, I simply surrender all of that to you. So I'm gonna ask as we sing this last song, Uh, actually two songs, I'm gonna ask that you would stand up and this be a time of you allowing the words the words of the song to be the words of response to God, where you actually say to him, God, I take my life. I'm, I'm surrendering it to you. These are great songs of response to him. And so don't just sing them because they're lyrics on the screen. Sing them because, because the Holy Spirit is inviting you to live a life that's not about you, to live a life that's actually about the glory of God. So you fight the battles, you engage in the war, but the the glory doesn't flow to you, it flows to the Father. All right, so would you please stand?
and allow the worship team to lead us in response to what God is doing in here. We're going to do this song, Take My Life. We're going to do the one we were originally planning on doing. I'll give her a second to put that up. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow and cease this praise. Take my hands and let them move at the end of chorus together. Surrender. 
Jesus, God wants every area of our life in the areas that you feel squeezed, maybe that he's calling you to release those areas to him. I know for me this week, I, there was areas in my life that I was trying to be the king of. And God was calling me, no, Jed, you're not the king of those areas. I need those areas of your life too. So I'd ask the prayer people to come forward. And as they do, Think of those areas that you need to release to Jesus, that you need to, that you need to let God have those areas of your life because they're squeezing you and he wants every bit of you. So I encourage you to come for prayer or turn to your neighbor and ask them for prayer. But as you leave today, leave quietly so others can come for prayer. Thank you. You are dismissed. I surrender all. I surrender.